Joe and Big Al spitball on the Mega Backdoor Roth, the five-year rules for Roth conversions, and investing in bonds. Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 451. Should Jim in New Jersey do the YMYW infamous Megatron, the Mega Backdoor Roth IRA, or use his Roth 401k? And how can he keep bonds out of his Roth accounts? The fellas discuss the January 1st start date when it comes to the five-year rule on Roth conversions for Nancy in Wisconsin, and they spitball on those Roth clocks and tax if efficient investments for Johnny Mercer in Savannah, Georgia, who also wants to know the pros and cons of bonds versus bond funds versus CDs. And should Brad in St. Louis incorporate bonds into his investment portfolio, given the fact that he will have pensions and Social Security providing five streams of fixed income in retirement? I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. Got Jim from New Jersey. Hey, Joe, Big Al, Andy, longtime listener, first time spitball requester. Now to the important stuff. I drive a 2017 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Enjoy a little bourbon old fashioned. Oh, there you go. You're old fashioned. Loves these old fashioned. <laughs> Fairly so. Yeah. No pets. Too much of a clean freak. Apologies in advance. I actually don't need an elaborate spitball here, <laughs> uh, but I have a mega garage back to our technical question that I have never heard addressed or found reliable in all of my searching. Oh, here it, we go. Has, Pressure's on. Does Jim think we're going to be reliable? I don't know. This is uh, 50-50. Well, we are pretty good at the old <laughs> Megatron. Yeah, that's true. Beef? Brief? Did beef just... demographics. <laughs> yeah, we got some demographics that are a little beefy beef. over here. <laughs> that's good. I like that better than brief. Beef, uh, beef demographics. Yeah, we got some beef one, beefy here. <laughs> uh, if I'm married, in my early 50s, around five years from retirement... In hyper accumulation phase. Oh, look at you. The big word. I killed it. Out oh, my God, I, kill, I, I bet Jim was trying to. You know what? Because it's two words you know how to pronounce. Uh, yep. And there's not a minus sign between them. There's not a minus <laughs> sign anywhere. <laughs> okay. We got Bia Roth contributions up to allowable limits plus. Yeah, that's a, plus is usually a plus. There's, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything else. <laughs> we got a plus, we got a minus. <laughs> HSA contributions after tax accumulation from vesting RSUs specific to Roth contributions, which I achieved via my company 401k. I've been taking full advantage of the Megatron for several years up to the limits, topping up at 73,500 this year, including employer match. <clears throat> While I know most answers to 401k questions end up referring me back to the plan doc, I've already read it intensively, <laughs> extensively. Both are good words. The re- <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Re- <laughs> the re- you said intensively <laughs> and extensively. Just get a little added boost there. <laughs> and I liked it so much, I read it again. <laughs> like, who reads the plan? This, this time only extensively. Oh, Jim, you got to get find some hobbies here. Okay. <laughs> have you read our plan document in 401k? No, I have not. Me neither. No, I have not. All right. So let's. Well, here's the details. My 401k plan allows the Megatron. So for those of you taking score here, that means you can place after-tax dollars into the 401k plan. If you're over 50, the maximum allowable defined contribution is 73500 Some of that is pre-tax. Some of that could be Roth. The additional after the 401k limits is going to be an after-tax component that you can put in. You don't pay tax on it. It would either sit in a plan after tax, so you never pay tax on those contributions again, or you could convert those dollars into Roths and have everything grow 100% tax-free. Yeah, better, yeah, because the growth will be tax-free. And so that's like a giant Roth contribution for those keeping score. And if you take this to any other financial planner and say, I want to do a Megatron, they're not going to understand unless they listen to YMYW. It's a did mega we, backdoor did, Roth. <laughs> oh, did we make that up? The Megatron? Megatron? That, that basically came from this show, yeah. It was actually Marcus in Tennessee slash Alabama <laughs> oh, he... that came up with that one, and we've been using it ever since. <laughs> well, maybe it's going to catch on then. I think so. All right. Okay. Additionally, any combinations of pre-tax, Roth, and after-tax contributions are eligible for employee match. My current bans in the 401k plan is made up of about half pre-tax from the employer match and half Roth right, from his contributions. Yeah. I typically jam in the after-tax contributions up to the limit toward the end of the year to ensure Congress doesn't pull the plug on the beloved Megatron or to limit earnings that also come out. And then I pull it out in December and transfer it to my Roth IRA. Okay. Good. 
One other important detail behind my question. My 401k plan only allows investment choices to be made uniformly across tax buckets. In other words, I cannot allocate my Roth dollars to one fund and pre-tax dollars to another fund. Fund allocations apply across buckets. While I'm heavily weighted into stocks, I do have some allocations to bonds given my proximity to retirement and also have a small allocation of my company stock with low basis to take advantage of NUA. Is this guy an advisor? I think so. Anyway, folks, is net unrealized appreciation. And that means that you can take company stock out of your 401k plan. You pay ordinary income tax only on the basis. And then you could sell the stock at a capital gains rate. So it's another kind of cool tax. It really is. A little and trick if you do have your own company stock inside your 401k plan. You got to, you have to be 59 and a half or terminated from service. Or, or, yeah, separated from service. Something like that. There's a triggering of that. Right. All right, given the 401k plan construction. Oh, boy. Do you ever talk about um, 401k plan construction? Oh, all the time. Let's What's say. your 401k plan constructed? Well, let me tell you, I, I, I read my plan extensively. <laughs> I was thinking of doing a different construction. Here's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I hate continuing to add Roth dollars in the plan that are then partially allocated to bonds and company stock, as I believe any Roth dollars for my situation should be in 100% equities. As it is for my Roth IRA, that brings me to my question. Okay. Oh, all right. This is good. Yeah. Are you on the edge of your seat? Yes. Okay. I had an idea. This reminds me of a question of the guy that should he take Social Security right away and he's worth like $400 million. <laughs> That's right. What was that last week? Yeah. Week yes. before? I had an idea to begin next year foregoing my annual 401k contributions, which currently goes 100% Roth. Instead, replacing those dollars with after-tax contributions, still maxing out the total allowable limit. Then he's going to, okay. Since I get the employer match on any contributions, including after-tax contributions, I see no difference between directing these dollars into a Roth 401k contribution versus directing them to a Roth IRA via the Megatron. The clear advantage is it would be better able to direct the investment allocation to my go-forward contributions which would end up in my Roth IRA. Appreciate all you do via your money or wealth and hoping you can spitball whether my planning strategy makes sense or you see any pitfalls based on the facts I laid out. All right, so the problem is this, is that he's, let's say, <clears throat> if I understand it correctly, he's contributing $70,000 roughly into the plan. Right. And out of that $70,000, he's got some money going into stock funds. He's got a little bit going into bond funds and he's got a little bit going into company stock. And so what he's stating is that he's got a Roth component in his 401k plan. Right. And then he's got a pre-tax component in his 401k plan because all of the other dollars that are after tax, he converts out into his Roth IRA. But it appears that the allocation that he's selecting is say that he's got, you know, let's say 50% in stocks, 10% or 20% in bonds and 30% in company stock. It's pro rata across sure. all different accounts. Yep. So he can't just select, I want stocks to go in my Roth. I want bonds just to go in the pre-tax and I want my company stock to go wherever. So he's, upset about this because he's getting bonds in his rock. Yeah. And he wants growth in his rock. And he doesn't want bonds in his rock. Right. He just wants to have a little high flyers. Yeah, sure. Because you get rewarded for high flyers in the Roth because you pay no taxes on the growth. So he's saying, you know what? I'm not going to go into Roth. I'm going to go all after tax and then convert everything into my Roth. Yeah. So let's say he does that. And then because he can buy and sell, I guess, within the Roth IRA, he can do whatever he wants. So maybe when the money comes into the Roth, there's some bonds there, but then he just sells the bonds out of his Roth IRA and then he has the allocation that he wants. Right. Although he still has in his current balance in the 401k about half is pre-tax and half are Roth contributions. So he can't pull that out until... No, what he's saying is future contributions. No, I understand. Yeah, future in other words don't add to the problem anymore I guess he, no he wants the seventy thousand dollar contributions not to go to the roth everything to after tax right 
Right. No, I understand. I'm just, and the backdoor Roth part comes out. I mean, or the Megatron <laughs> backdoor, whatever you call it. So that still comes out. That goes to Roth. That can be invested aggressively. But he's trying to, He's. Try, I guess what he's saying is maybe I don't want to add more Roth contributions to the account because I end up with bonds in Roth and I don't really want to do that. It, right. So is his strategy viable? Can So he wants to put $70,000 in after tax and convert the $70,000 out in December. Yeah. Can you do that? I don't see why not. <laughs> I guess it depends upon the plan. That's why he said <laughs> no one can give him the, the right answer. And he says, I don't want to hear you guys saying it's up to the plan, Doc. Yeah, he, that's what he said. Yep. But if it's an after-tax contribution, so I've never seen a plan that allows you to go either Roth, pre-tax, or just straight after-tax. Because no one would ever do straight after-tax, would you, if you had the option to do a Roth? Well... I mean, straight after tax means you're going to put it in a Roth, right? Yeah, but not necessarily with him. He's going to convert it to a Roth. Yeah. Because it's not going into the Roth 401k. It's not. He's not taking advantage of the Roth provision of the 401k plan. Right. Are you, are you just I, saying, right? Are, are you I, following I, me? I, I'm, I'm about 75%. <laughs> <laughs> I got lost in this one. You answer it. You answer the question. <laughs> How do I know that? You're like, yeah, right. And then you're just nodding your head at me. I'm like, okay, you son. Of and then I'm going, if I what if I can get there? <laughs> See if I can bluff him. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, then you answer. Yeah, well, I'm trying to. I'm just, just I'm trying to get your opinion. <laughs> what I asked you was, can you do a hundred percent after tax? I don't. I would have to look at the plan. The plan? I know. I, <laughs> I think that's the answer. So, Jim, look at your plan, Doc, and see if you can do a 100% after tax. If, if See why he wouldn't be able to. So l let's just answer it this way. If you can, sure, it's a great idea. Sure. Why not? Because then you can control every the whole $70,000 yeah. goes into the Roth IRA. Yeah. Yeah. But the employer match part? No. I mean, so part of it is pre-tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then what he's saying is that Instead of the money that he's contributing to the Roth component of the 401k plan, I, that just that doesn't seem right to me. He can't rebalance. He can't reallocate. But I suppose when he reallocates or when he rebalances, it just rebalances across the, 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 whole thing. the whole thing. That's what he's saying. It's pro rata. On so if he wants 20% in bonds, 20% is, is going to be in the Roth. Right. It, I would say, you know what? You're going to retire in a couple of years? I think this is a lot of nonsense for nothing. Well, that that actually was going to be my final conclusion is it probably works if the plan document lets you. But who cares? I mean, it sounds like you got a lot of money already in Roth IRA. So this is a little bit of bond money. I'm not too worried. Right. So you're instead of let's say he has 100 percent equities, he gets 8 percent versus 7.8. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, true. <laughs> I mean, it's it doesn't move the needle that much. It doesn't move the yeah. We're, it's not going to push you over to the finish line here. I don't think. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. I think he just loves this stuff so much. Oh, big time! That that's why he's constructing the portfolio. Exactly. All right. Well, I love the question, Jim. Good luck with everything. Appreciate it. Lifetime tax-free growth on investments. That's the big draw of Roth accounts. And now with the Secure Act 2.0, there are even more Roth options available. Make sure you understand how Roth accounts work so you can take full advantage of their tax-saving benefits. Visit the podcast show notes and download the complete Roth Papers package. You'll receive the Roth Basics Guide, the five-year rules for Roth IRA withdrawals, and the ultimate guide to Roth IRAs. You'll get valuable details about Roth IRA contributions and conversions and the backdoor Roth strategy for when you make too much money to contribute directly to a Roth. Plus, learn the differences and the pros and cons of saving in a traditional IRA versus a Roth IRA versus a Roth 401k and the rules for taking money from your Roth account and much more. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app. Go to the show notes, download the complete Roth Papers package, and share the show and all these free financial resources. All yours, all from your money, your wealth. Nancy from Wisconsin writes in, hey, Andy, Joe, now. A little background on me. I retired a couple years ago. I have no mortgage or going on debt or ongoing debt. No more critters in my house. 
Okay, no more pets or kids. I assume pets. My drink of choice is unsweetened iced tea. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, I don't even like sweetened iced tea myself. All right, my only adult beverage is a Christmas gift of a bottle of wine from my neighbor every year. Sorry, Joe. No drinking excitement here. See? Yeah, yeah. I knew that was coming. <laughs> you still love her? I do. Okay. I do live I do live near Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but I can't stand the taste of beer. And I don't like football. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, from Wisconsin? Yeah. Yes. I have been accused of not really being from Wisconsin. There you go. Question. So Nancy drinks unsweet nice tea, doesn't like beer, can't stand the taste of it or the smell of it. And no football. Or, or, or no football. And, and anyone that. And where are you from? Wisconsin. <laughs> like those Packers? No. You know. <laughs> That's sacrilege. Okay. Now, I ask for a clarification of the Roth IRA conversion and the five year rules related to dates. I read that Roth conversion dates default back to January 1st of the year the conversion is done. True. That is true. Based on this, my understanding is that if I do a Roth conversion in September, it really defaults back to January 1st of the year the five-year rule start date. Correct. Can you clarify how the January 1st default start date applies to the five-year rule? Did we answer that? Did we just do that? I think so. I thought she answered it. Yeah. So you are correct. Yeah. You understand the rules quite well. Yeah. You do the conversion or the Roth contribution in October. It goes back to January 1st. That's your start date for the five-year client. So how this really comes into play is that if I'm doing a contribution, you have until April the following year to do the contribution for the year, right? You have your until your sure. tax filing deadline. Yeah. And so <clears throat> if I do a Roth contribution in 2024 for the 2023 tax year, it reverts back to January 1st of 2023. Sure. But, right. you, but you have to be able to qualify. You have to be qualified. Yes. Yeah. If I do a conversion in April of 2024, well, that start date is January, January 1st of 2024. 2024. Right. Exactly. Can you clear? And so it was, is that clear enough? I think Andy, so. are you with me? I think so. All yes. Right. Yeah. All right. What's, is there anything else? I don't know. Do you know, I'm just still <laughs> shocked. She doesn't like even the smell of beer. You can't get past that. I now. can't. All right. I wonder if she likes cheese. Uh, uh, <laughs> doubt it. Let's say I'll be 59 and a half next month. If I do a Roth conversion this month, before I turn 59 and a half, will the five-year rule be different than if I do Roth conversions next month? After I turn 59 and a half. Where is she? Well, yeah, what is she really getting at here? She, what she's getting at, if I do the conversion after I'm 59 and a half, is it different rules than before 59 and a half? So it sounds like she's like right there. Or will they both technically fall under the same five year rule? Do I need to wait until next year to have a post 59 and a half year rule apply if the date defaults to January 1st? Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. No, do it this year because the five year clock starts the longer of 59 and a half and five years. So once you hit 59 and a half, as long as you had it five years, you're good. Right. So do it now. Get the January 1st of 2023 and you're golden. Now, the five year clock, realize what that means. It's, yeah, it's, it just means it's five years or 59 and a half, whichever is longer. longer. That's right. So if you do it now, maybe you won't get to pull out the income or growth until. 64 or whatever age, you know, five, like maybe even 60, yeah, probably 64, right? But it also means, and this is true of any conversion, once you're over 59 and a half, you can pull out those conversion funds, right? Tax free, no problem. You just can't pull out the growth. If you're under 59 and a half and you're trying to pull out the growth, You've got a five-year clock for every conversion. That that's what changes at fifty-nine and a half. Yeah, the second five-year clock is almost irrelevant once you turn fifty-nine and a half. Correct. So well, if she, you're playing these kind of weird things, January first for non-January, just do the conversion, and then once you turn fifty-nine and a half, you got different rules. Yeah, but in her defense, this is confusing. Yeah. I mean, you read the IRS publication on this. Good luck. Yeah. Did I seem like an ass or something to her? No. <laughs> She's sticking up for Nancy. I am. You, you going to sit down and have a little unsweetened tea? I'm going to have a bowl of cheese with it. <laughs> uh, let's go. Choose a name for me, Andy. I chose Johnny Mercer. 
because this emailer is from Savannah, Georgia. And so Johnny Mercer is a very famous lyricist, songwriter, and the co-founder of Capitol Records. And he was also born in Savannah, Georgia. All right. Andy, Joan, Al, thank you for taking my questions. No questions. I have been absorbing your wit and wisdom for about two years now. After your podcast was recommended by David Graham. That's hmm. FIPhysician.com. Hey, David. Who's David? FI Physician. Oh, yeah, he's the, he's the guy that voted us uh, best podcast retirement podcast with humor. Yeah, like I, four years in a row. Wow, I, I did. I remember. I didn't remember. I didn't know the name, but I remember it that. All right. Well, thank you, David Graham. Yeah, I'm 67, and drive a 2015 Honda CRV, which, like me, is still in its prime. Oh, I like it. Uh, okay. Like Johnny Mercer. Yeah, right. Just, just coming out blazing. <laughs> Throwing heat, well, high heat at us here. Uh, my lovely and in, insightful wife is 64 and drives a 2018 Lexus RX 350. Her drink of choice is Napa Valley Pinot Noir. 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 <laughs> Pinot. Don't people just call it like a Pinot? They, go, they say Pinot. Pinot. But Pinot. there's also Pinot Grigio. So, Ooh. Well, that's true. You have to know which one. Got it. <laughs> and I'm a sucker for a good lager beer. Either draft or in a dark glass bottle. That makes me that makes it look expensive. Yeah, you gotta have the look. <laughs> well, you know, my dad drank red, white, and blue. That came in a dark bottle. And that was like really cheap ass beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, he fooled a lot of people, didn't he? She is like the returnable bottles. Oh yeah, I remember those. Remember those? Yep. Yeah, that's what he would drink. Okay. Another like two cents or to return or I five cents. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh all right. Well, she's already she is already retired. I plan to work until age seventy. We have no debt and typically spend about two hundred thousand dollars a year. I don't expect our expenses to change much in retirement. I've recently cut back at work, but expect my income will still cover expenses until retirement. I've decreased contributions to only the amount required to qualify for matching funds, so we'll only be adding about two thousand dollars a month to our retirement accounts until retirement. Social Security will yield $72,000 a year, and I'll have a government pension of about $35,000. We currently have $4 million in qualified retirement accounts that are roughly 50-50 split between stocks and bonds. Hmm. Four mil. It's a like big it. account. Like it. We have $250,000 in a brokerage account, currently in our money market fund, making 5%. I started a Roth IRA conversion account about two years ago, but have not yet contributed much in it. Primarily... Because I've been in the 32% tax bracket until this year, well, I'll cut back. Unless there is some Malthusian. What the hell does that mean? It's a reference to, uh, what was the guy's name? Maltus. Uh, come on. Something really bad, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, I actually have seen that term. but I His I'm theory not... that population tends to increase at a faster rate than its means of subsistence. And unless it is checked by moral restraint or disaster, widespread poverty and degradation inevitably result. All right, a Malthusian <laughs> economic collapse in our lifetime. <laughs> I think we'll be okay in terms of retirement income, but I do have two questions. Okay. All right. I plan to make money. I plan, <clears throat> excuse me, to take money out of our qualified accounts at the top of the 24% tax break. <clears throat> a little tickle my throat here. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you do it? Yeah. Go I ahead. plan to take out money in our qualified accounts up to the top of the 24% tax bracket or whatever it may be after 2026. I would like to hear your spitball regarding Roth conversion IRA versus brokerage account using tax efficient funds. So he wants to take money out of the big $4 million retirement account. And he's asking us to put it into a Roth or tax efficient funds. Sure. Okay. Yep. All right. I was originally planning on Roth, but recently found out from you guys, the five-year rule for assessing the money applies to each conversion rather than when the account was open. I'm concerned that if I box early, this money won't be available to my wife without penalties if I box early. Yeah. Oh my God, I'd love that <laughs> saying. That's that's a great saying. Yeah, I mean, you're just gonna go in a wood box. Just gonna <laughs> box it out, so it's different. Yeah, babe. If I box early, <laughs> I just want to make sure that Roth IRA is available to you because we only have four million bucks. So, ironically, one of the reasons I like the idea of Roth was it to protect her from at least somewhat from a widow's penalty of higher taxes because she would eventually be filing as a single person. I also like the idea of being able to put money into tax inefficient investments in the Roth if I choose to. 
My other question is about fixed income. All right, let's just let's, let's start, just start get with this that, out huh? of the way. Yeah, the five year. Yeah, the five year. Oh rule. boy, here we go. Well, how old is Johnny? Sixty seven. Johnny, don't worry about the five year rule on on every conversion because that's only if you're under fifty nine and a half. So the five year rule, if you already have a Roth, which you opened two years ago, you can convert money into that Roth IRA in your five year clock started two years ago. Correct. And by the way, you can always take your contribution or conversion out of it tax free without penalty. It's just the growth. Right. So if, if he boxes out, his wife can take any money that he converted. Right. The, she just can't touch the earnings for another three years. Yeah. And let's say over time you convert. 400,000, right? And the 400,000 of the Roth grows to 475, right? She can take out $400 for dollar because the growth part doesn't come out till after the principal. So the 75,000, she'd have to wait five years. Now, if you live another three, then you're golden. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all good. If you don't, if you live, if, if you die prematurely, like right away, she's got to wait three years to get that extra 75,000, but she can take the 400. But the conversion on the five-year clock on each conversion is only applies to people that are under 59 and a half. Correct. Because when if, if they didn't have that rule, people would be able to take their conversion out and avoid the 10% penalty because they pay taxes on the conversion. Then they could take it out the next day or the next year. If they were under 59 and a half, that was just a bypass rule for them to get away from the 10% early withdrawal penalty. Right. So they Correct. created that rule to put a stop to that loophole. Yep, exactly. All right. My other question is about fixed income. I've been using bond funds in my qualified accounts, thinking that they're a good stabilizer. It could probably provide me income for my expenses, RMDs, et cetera. The last couple of years, though, have shown how wrong that thinking was. My Vanguard total bond fund is still 15% below what I paid for it. I'm leaning towards laddered CDs and or individual bonds at this point, at least for now, since they are paying well, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Thanks again. Okay, Johnny, we answered the Roth. Now, bond funds. Yeah, what are your thoughts? I, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, <laughs> okay, I got all day. So he bought the Vanguard Total Bond Fund Index, and I'm guessing that I don't own that fund, but I'm guessing it mirrors the index because it's an index fund. And he's going to have all sorts of different maturities, all sorts of different types of bonds within that overall index fund. Yeah, total bond index fund probably means short, midterm, and long term. Mid, short, treasuries. Right, right. Well, right, everything um, corporate. Yeah, corporate, yeah. mortgage back, right. whatever. And so a bond is a loan, first off. It's not a stock. <clears throat> so when you purchase a bond, right? So let's say I'd lend my good friend Alan a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Are, are we talking now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he pays me five percent interest. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm going to receive that five thousand dollars per year. And then at the end of the term of the loan, I receive my hundred thousand dollars back. If I have it. Hopefully you have it. If you don't have it, then that's called a default. <laughs> that's the problem. Right. Yeah. But if if I look at the amount of defaults that happen, it's a pretty minimal amount. Correct. So when he's seen the bond fund go down. He might be thinking, oh, this is not good, right? Is there defaults? If a stock fund goes down, that means maybe the company is not in favor anymore, right? Something happened. They're not meeting expectations, what the market anticipated them to do for the stock price to go up. But with a bond fund, it's a loan. It's a note. So let's say if interest rates go up, what happens to bond prices, yeah, they go down. They go down only if you redeem the bond or if you want to sell the bond to a second party. Yeah, so so you loan me 100000 at 5%. You want to get out of it. So you go to the secondary market and interest rates are now 8%. You're going to have to get a discount, right? Because no one will buy it. Right, because they can get 8% on a new bond. Why would they pay you the full price for a 5%? So you just do the math to figure out what 8% equivalent is, and it's a reduced bond price. So, but if I hold that bond to maturity, Correct. I'm going to get the hundred thousand dollars back. Yeah. But if I'm I'm looking to redeem it early, right? Well, eight percent is the going market, so the bond price is going to go down. So you're going to see bond prices, and these bond funds have done just that. So if I buy an individual bond, I have a little bit more predictability or certainty if avoiding defaults that I know that I'm going to get that 
that par value back at maturity. A bond fund is going to be a little bit different, but there's thousands and thousands of bonds within that bond fund. Right? I don't even know. I'm guessing probably 10,000 different types of bonds. So all of these different bonds are going to come to maturity at different times. And then as interest rates stabilize or go up or down, you're going to see some of that par value come back. So for me, what I sell the bond today and get into an equivalent security when I already bought the risk, you already bought the risk. You're just paying for it right now because a bond fund with a 30-year maturity is going to be more risky than a treasury bond that has a 30-day maturity. Correct. But I'm going to get more yield on that 30-year bond because I'm taking on more risk. Right. So he's already bought the risk. Should I sell out of the bond fund and buy individual bonds? I don't know. I don't think I would. Yeah, I, I wouldn't either. Because here's the thing. If the interest rates start to come down again, and they probably will after we get inflation under control, then what you're going to see is the bond funds increase and they will you'll earn a lot more than a CD. And that see, that's your protection, right? As, as interest rates come down, it basically means the economy is sputtering, right? So interest rates come down to try to spur that on. And that's typically at the same time stocks are down. Interest rates come down, bonds go up. It's a good counterbalance to stocks. But I guarantee within the fund that he's buying, they're buying those bonds today that have high yields. Right. Oh, for sure. So, yeah. So it it, it all turns around, <laughs> right? So, uh, in, in in fact, so if you, if you look at long term studies, because there there's been trends, long term trends of interest rates going up and going down. Yeah, certainly when interest rates go down, bond funds do better because interest rates are lower, and vice versa when interest ra rates go up. But interesting enough, when you look at long term trends of that, it's not that far apart. And the reason it's not that far apart is because over time you get higher interest rate bonds in your portfolio and you do almost as well, really. So, I, yeah, the last two years, right. If we had a crystal ball, we probably wouldn't have done that, right? Or you wouldn't have done that. But the point is, right now, this you've already paid for the risk. Interest rates come down. You're going to be glad you have it. Yeah. I mean, I would just hold tight. I like the strategy. It's a very low cost fund. It's a good fund. It's a right? great, great fund. So, yeah. Don't buy yesterday's winners today. Download 10 Steps to Improve Investing Success and the Investing Basics Guide for free from the podcast show notes to learn more about all kinds of asset classes, including stocks, mutual funds, target date funds, and fixed income from bonds. You'll also find out how asset allocation and capital gains impact your investment choices, and you'll see how controlling your emotions and your risk can lead to higher returns in your investment portfolio so you can retire with more wealth. Take your investing skills to the next level. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app, go to the show notes, and download 10 Steps to Improve Investing Success and the Investing Basics Guide for free. You'll find them right before the episode transcript. Good morning, Big Al and Little Joe. Oh, right off the bat, we got a little funny guy. Yeah, we, yeah, we did. <laughs> this is Brad coming to you from sunny St. Louis. Didn't know St. Louis was the sunshine state. Well, it, apparently it can be. It is My, for Brad. My wife and I are both 37 and are currently maxing out my 401k and 403b, two Roth IRAs, and we have a brokerage account. We have $550,000 in investment accounts, $30,000 in I-bonds, twenty five dollars in cash, and one paid off rental property. Wow. Another big wallet here. Yeah, look at the big wallet it's, and a big Brad. It's coming up, I can yeah. tell. We're invested in almost all stocks with a very small portion in a REIT fund. My question is what is the best strategy for starting to incorporate bonds into the portfolio? Do we convert a large portion into bonds in addition to increasing the percentages of bonds with paycheck deductions or just start increasing with our paycheck deductions? That was the same start. thing twice. No, he's like, hey, do I reallocate? And then with the deductions that are going in from his paycheck, does he change the allocation? Yeah, so that it gets ah, got it, to got where got he wants to be. Yep. Retirement always seems so far away. So I always, I'm always willing to take more risk, but I'm hoping to retire at 57. How old's Big Brad? 37. Okay, he's got 20 years. Yep. So I wanted to start thinking about a strategy to balance the portfolio. We will also have five streams of fixed income. Five, not four, or three. Five. Wow. And he, he lists them too. We got a little military pension. Or my pension, her pension. No, my pension, her pension, a military reserve pension. Thank you for your service, Brad. And two social security annuities. That's five. There's five. 
plus the rental property. That would be six. Does having this fixed income change our strategy to balance our accounts and take on a little bit more risk? I drive a 2010 Camry. She drives a 2017 Pacifica. We both drink high noons in Coors. And we don't have any animals other than our four boys. Thanks. Love the show. All right, Brad. Thanks for the. <clears throat> this is a, an interesting strategy. Let's it's someone that has high fixed income. They right. have high pensions. They have high fixed income. Some experts in our field say, you know what, that could be a component of your bond or fixed income component of the portfolio. So you could take on more risk in your liquid assets. Right. And particularly if your fixed income is going to cover your expenses anyway, who cares? Might might as well take on be those. more aggressive. Yeah. And it sounds like, Brad, you're okay being all in the market because that's what you're doing right now. Right. Most people don't have pensions. Right. That's why bonds are such a key component of their of a portfolio. If you have three pensions and you have your Social Security benefits, yeah, and that's covering a, a lion's share of your overall fixed income, yeah, then I would probably not invest a ton of money in bonds. Yeah, and at, I mean, even if you didn't have all these pensions, you're 20 years away from retirement. You're okay being all in. I mean, me personally, 10 years from now, call I, us. I would stay put for a while. Yeah, I would not touch a thing. He's retiring in 20 years. I think he's probably 10 years from retirement, probably even five years from retirement. Yeah, it's I, really kind of I, where I, you want to start allocating your portfolio appropriately. You don't want to do it the year before retirement sure. just because if the market takes a dump and, you know, you're kind of. You, you could get, I mean, even the left so, hold in the bag there. So the great recession, which is the worst market we've had in our lifetime, right? That the market was off for 18 months. It wasn't five years, right? So if, if you think about this five years before, then you can sort of, even if there's another great recession, you'll probably be okay. Yeah. So I would not do anything different than what he's currently doing. But as he gets probably five years from retirement, then that's when I would want to make the switch. Me, me too. And even still, with all this fixed income, you might not even need to. Right. It's like, I mean, it's up to you what your goals are with the money. Yeah. And I think what you look at is that you need to place the portfolio of what the portfolio needs to do when you need it. You, you don't want to try to time things. So if I'm five or four years from retirement, I'm like, okay, well, how much income needs to be produced or how much, what, what's my distribution rate from the portfolio? That's when I would reconstruct the overall portfolio at that point, right? Versus saying, well, markets are up. Maybe I keep continue to ride this thing or markets are down a little bit. Maybe I try to ride it back up because you don't know what directions it's going to go. Yeah. So you just want to make sure that you're diligent in your overall planning. Five years is probably the right amount of time. You know, I would just sell and get it in the right portfolio right now if I was, let's say, five years from retirement. Right. So, and, but he's got 15 years. Right. And and the, the right portfolio for you. See, this is the problem with, with like reading an article on how you should position your portfolio. Your retirement. Glide path. Yeah. It's like, it's, well, uh, it's different for everybody. I mean, I guess there's guidelines, right? But I mean, and we've said this before, I'll say it again. We know we have clients in our 80s that are 100% in the stock market. Why? Because they don't need it. It's for the kids and grandkids. Right. So why do they want bonds, right? Exactly. They've got so much other income. They have way more income, fixed income or rental property income or whatever it may be that they they don't know what else to do with it, right? So it, this is for, so it depends upon your own situation and your own goals. The fact that you have five retirement uh, income streams plus the rental, I'm going to call it six, plus you've already saved half a million dollars by 37 and what's that going to be in another 20 years it's going to be a big number it's got a big wallet you're in good shape yeah so i yeah i wouldn't worry too much about Rack a high noon. yeah yeah just say i'm blessed all right is that it that's it that's it that's it okay awesome well, well thank you all for your questions uh you make the show really appreciate it andy thanks for producing such a wonderful program oh thank you Joe. yes we value you for sure i appreciate uh, that Wow, we can shoot kiss ass. I, I am trying to improve our employee culture by complimenting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it for us. 
We'll see you next week. Show's got your money on. Drinking old fashions and twisted tea and boxing early with Johnny Mercer and the D-Rails, so stick around. Help new listeners find YMYW by telling your friends about the show and by leaving your honest reviews and ratings for Your Money, Your Wealth in Apple Podcasts and any other podcast app that accepts them. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 to schedule your free financial assessment in person at one of our seven offices around the country or online at a date and time convenient for you no matter where you are. Chances are one of the experienced financial professionals at Pure will be able to identify strategies to help you create a more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. I don't believe I've ever had one, so I guess I better try. You never had an old-fashioned? No. no. Me either. What's wrong with you? So anyway, <laughs> next time I come over to your house, make I, I'll make you an old-fashioned. Yeah, no I'll, problem. Let's see what it's like. Yeah. Do you want a little muddled? You want muddled or? I'll trust you. Whatever <laughs> you you give me. Uh, here's a twisted tea. You ever had a little twisted tea there, Big Al? No, I've had what's it called? The Arnold Palmer lemonade and, and tea, and that that's okay. How about a John Daly? I forget what that is. I've heard of it. That's the same with a little vodka. Oh. <laughs> no, nah, I don't want that. Twisted tea. You ever had that, Andy? I don't yeah. like tea. It Not sounds tea like thing. it's spiked with something. It is a little spiked. Yeah. Yeah. I had yes, one. Of delicious those. hard iced tea. <laughs> yeah. They go down really fast. They do. And they're not that great. But when I was in Texas, when I almost died of heat stroke, <laughs> I was playing Got it. golf. Got him. Uh, yeah, yeah, I had a little. Remember that time. Yeah. So this guy had a twisted tea. And, that's and I was so it. thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> you just drank it. I just slammed just like, the whole thing. It's like, whatever. I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Johnny Mercer is a very famous lyricist, songwriter, and the co-founder of Capitol Records. And he was also born in Savannah, Georgia. So he wrote songs like Blues in the Night and Accentuate the Positive, Old Black Magic, Hooray for Hollywood. Okay. Got it. Didn't recognize he's one of those songs. Oh, wow. Hooray for Hollywood? Yeah. <laughs> Hooray for Hollywood. Wait, you've heard that. <laughs> yeah. You've probably heard most of the songs on this list. I bet you have. Johnny Mercer. How old is Johnny Mercer? Johnny Mercer is long gone. But he still asks questions. Yeah, right. <laughs> Amazing. He died in 1976. The, the oh, real yeah. Johnny Mercer. Got it. Okay. Got it. The box early. Yeah, that is an interesting way of saying it. I love it. We should start doing that. Yeah. It's What's the... your box expect- expectancy? <laughs> 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 you know when you're going to box out? What? Right. It's like, and then someone brings up someone else. Have they, has your dad passed already? Are you, has, <laughs> has your dad boxed? <laughs> yeah. How's your family? Anyone hit the box yet? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry. Is it too soon, Andy? Too soon? No, not at all. Okay. All right. Did you have a loss in your family recently? No, she's still kicking. Okay. All right. Grandma is 90 and still raising hell. All right, good. Yeah, now you're in the clear. Was it sure? It, it might be offensive to our, our listeners. But... Right. Oh, Johnny Mercer. I'm boxing out. <laughs> <laughs>